I want the ministry to grow. I want, you know, it's great to have a taste. It's great to, to, to have an opportunity to, to preach the gospel one on one. But man, I'd like to preach the gospel one on two, or one on ten, or one on a hundred. You know, every preacher ought to dream about preaching the gospel to thousands. You know, I had a, I had a dream of the day. Uh, you know, Phil Robertson, I don't know whether the man saved or lost, to be quite honest with you. I have no idea, but I heard him on Sean Hannity last week. He got a couple minutes, a snippet of conversation to comment on the Super Bowl, which he thought Tom Brady would win, and a uh, comment on some other political in, in, in instances. And he spent the whole time giving the gospel. And he said, Sean, you need to trust Jesus as your Savior. And the whole world needs what I did. I mean, he had a couple minutes being interviewed by Sean Hannity, and he used it as a platform to preach the gospel. And then he wanted to baptize Sean Hannity because the Church of Christ individuals believe baptism is part of, the, of salvation. But I'm telling you, he gave the gospel independently of baptism before that. So I don't know if Phil Robertson's a saved man or not. I know that the Church of Christ is an occult in the sense that it, it teaches that the gospel is more than Jesus Christ alone. It teaches that salvation is ultimately through baptism. And so, uh, but you know, I think about it, I think, man, that's an honorable thing. The man gets one chance to speak in a, in a I mean, he's, had, he's been on the national scene before, but he gets a chance to be interviewed on the national scene. And he, the thing he says is, I want to tell everybody about Jesus. And uh, you ought to pray for God to God that you get a chance to do that. If you get a chance to say something for Jesus or preach the gospel more. But you know, you ought to want more ministry, shouldn't you? You ever enjoy serving the Lord? You ever realize how fun it is just to serve the Lord? When you serve the Lord, have you ever felt like, hey, you know what, I'd like to do more? I'd like to do this. That's great. I'd like to do it for the rest of my life. That's great. Hey, listen, I'm going to tell you something. I never want to retire from serving the Lord. Never want to have a time in my life when I, you know, back out of the ministry and, and, and hands off. Hey, I may be a time when I don't lead a ministry, but I never want to have a time when I'm not just up to my knees in it and uh, up to my shoulders in it, up to my eyeballs in it. I want to be in the ministry, but I want more. And that was kind of what we saw last week with Isaiah. Here he is. He is already at the place where King Uzziah has died, and God's asked the question, Who will go for me? Who shall I send? And Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. And then God told him about his ministry. It's going to be kind of a hard ministry. Hearing, you know, they're going to have, they're going to hear, they're not going to, they're not, their ears are going to be closed, their, uh, their uh, vision's going to wax gross, their they're, they, they're, they're not going to respond to the gospel. And Isaiah said, how long? How long is this going to be for? And he said, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, until uh, the, the houses are without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking. And then he said, yet in it there shall be a tenth. And we're reminded in the ministry that everything that uh, we are trying to achieve, trying to attain as far as lost souls go, this is... If I had my way, everybody would preach the gospel to would be born again. And you know that's what God wants too. But the reality of it is God says with regard to Judah, one-tenth. That's less than two of the twelve tribes. That's, that's, that's less than the ten tribes and, and, the, and the, the two tribes that didn't defect from, uh, with Israel. Less than one. It's really just one tribe of Israel. That's it. God said that's what's going to be. That's what's going to be a remnant in the land. Friend, I want to remind you that, you know, one-tenth of what God can do is a lot. You ever think about how full heaven will be? If 90% of people in the world go to hell and 10% go to heaven, there's still a lot of people in heaven. I tremble to think of how many are going to hell, but there's still a lot of people in heaven. And you know, I think our numbers are a little better than that, even in Oakland Park right now. You'd be surprised. The wicked would have you to think that there's nothing but wickedness. But you'd be surprised if you go into Safeway sometime and just talk to everybody you meet. You'd be surprised. I think more than 10 of them will be born again on average. That's my experience. So God's working and God's doing great things. And this is the call of Isaiah to ministry. But it's notable to me this evening what I want to kind of focus in a little bit on. And we've, we've, we've touched on it uh, before Christmas time. I want to focus on this verse in in uh, chapter 8, verse 18, when Isaiah said, Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Literally, Isaiah understood the importance of his and his children's being a physical illustration for God. 
Uh, go back with me, if you will, just briefly. So let me remind you about what we looked at in chapter 7. This was before Christmas because we were looking at Messianic prophecy in Isaiah. Chapter 7, and uh, this is in verse 1. It came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, uh, king of Judah, that Rezan, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem to war against it, but could not prevail against it. And he was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim, and his heart was moved in the heart of his people as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. So Ahaz is, is basically shaking in his boots, is what verse 3, verse 2 means. They were shaken in the wind, and they were scared. They were afraid of Israel, but they were more afraid of Syria's allegiance with Israel. In verse 3, the Bible says, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Sher Joseph thy son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fuller's field. And so he's told to take Sher Jashub, and uh, Sher Jashub's name, Isaiah's son, means a remnant shall return. Now, I don't know much more about Sher Jashub. Do you? You don't find him being mentioned a great deal in life. But I think that uh, much in the same way that I can remember a few times going with my father on a task for the Lord. I remember going soul winning with my dad when I was a child, being a young person. And I mean, we'd, before we left, we'd pray for whoever we were going to go visit. And uh, my dad would say, okay, here's what I want you to do while we visit. I want you to pray for whatever. And it made an impact on me as a child. And I can imagine Isaiah, his call to the ministry, he said, Lord, I, here am I, I'll go, you send me. God outlines the plan that he has. And he's told, Isaiah, in spite of the fact that the land is going to be a wasteland and it's going to be without inhabitant, there's going to be a remnant. And so Isaiah gets to name his son Remnant. Now this is not leftovers at the carpet factory. This is uh, the name of Isaiah's son. And it's an illustration. Literally the little boy, when he would, go to, when he would uh, play with his friends, hey, what's up, leftovers? You know, uh, what's up, Remnant? And he literally was a, a testimony of God's future work, God's future plan. In other words, that in spite of how bad it can be, it's not over. And he's taken, along with Isaiah, up to where Ahaz the king is taking care of the pool and kind of preparing for war, maybe trying to secure things. And uh, Ahaz is out and he's busy and he's not really even open. But Isaiah said, Remnant, you got an important task. What is it, Dad? Your name. <laughs> I need you to come along and I need to explain that there's going to be something left. Now, it'd be neat. I don't know if it's real, if it really happened this way, but I think it would be cool in my mind's eye this way I imagine it. So there's, uh, you know, artistic license in my imagination here. Uh, and so I see it as, you know, Isaiah and Remnant, as I hereafter call his son, whose real name is uh, Sher Jashub. But Isaiah and Remnant uh, come up to the pool, and here's Ahaz working away. And it's just appropriate for me for Ahaz to have, you know, about seven more people there, so it makes a total of ten. And then for Isaiah to, you know, set Remnant aside and say, hey, listen, even if all of us got wiped out, God's going to leave a remnant. And it'd be really, in my mind's eye, Remnant's kind of a scrawny little fellow, you know, and, uh, you know, not much to look at, not real impressive. But uh, I'd like to imagine in my mind's eye that he grows up and he's quite a man in his own right. And that's, what, that's all that's left out of all those ten people, but it's one left. And here's a reminder as well that God always has a remnant. You cannot find an age in history when there have not been individuals who are adherents and who love the true living God. And we need to find the courage and encouragement in this. So now we are in chapter 8. We're in the place where there, is a, uh, where there is a conspiracy. And Isaiah's second son is born. And uh, God said to Isaiah, He said, take a roll and uh, write in it with a uh, man's pen. I don't know what the with a man's pen signifies. Maybe it's just in contrast to the tablets that God wrote on for Moses. You know, Maybe it's not write in stone, but write on a scroll with, with a man's pen. But either way, right on it, mahar, mahar meaning skilled or practiced, shalal meaning pray, and uh, hashbaz meaning spoil, 
and it simply means swift to the prey or swift to the spoil. And he said, I want you to make a record of this son. He went into the prophetess, his son was born, and he had Uriah the priest and a contemporary prophet, the same individual we see that writes Zechariah, the son of uh, Berechiah, or in this case, Jeberechiah, Jumer same prophet, Zechariah. And they come as witnesses and they do the writing of the things that God is going to say regarding Mahar, Shalal, Hashbaz. So he's got remnant and he's got predator for his sons. Now these are great boys' names, aren't they? I mean, I'm thinking about it. If God gives me some boys, you know, having remnant and predator, you know, I mean, parents would name their kids weird things anyway. So why not? I mean, Harbor Freight uses the name predator on their engines, and it's a great, uh, you know, great analogy of how they have preyed on uh, Honda's technology or whatever. <laughs> it is, but great names, I think. So here's the name of the son, Predator, and he is an illustration of what we're going to look at specifically this evening, and that is that there are going to be individuals that are going to prey on Israel. And so look at um, verse 5. I want to go quickly through uh, this passage of Scripture. In uh, verse 5, the Scripture says, well, no, verse 4. I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Verse 4. For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, my father and my mother. So I don't know when the average age of, the, of a boy speaking is. Uh, boys are usually later than girls. I think I began talking, it might have been earlier than this. It might have been, it was ridiculous, whatever it was. I started talking <laughs> earlier, in case you didn't guess. I was at a young age, and my first, uh, this was in our game the other night. What was your first word? I got to put the first word, what's. But he was, what's that? And I was pointing to the shifter in my dad's truck, which I now own. I have, actually have my dad's truck that I said my first words in when I was a kid. You've never seen it because it's sitting in a shelter belt in Kansas. <laughs> but I still have it. And he was shifting. And when he was shifting, as a curious, uh, older than 12-month-old, I think, I said, what's that? To, about the shifter. Because, you know, I wanted to know what he was doing. When he's driving, I was going to steal the vehicle as a one-year-old go somewhere, I think. Anyway, uh, here's a little boy, and the Bible says before he's old enough to say dada or mama, before he's old enough to say that, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria shall be taken away before the king of Assyria. And now we see this betrayal of Israel, we see that Israel itself is betrayed. And so in verse 5, the Lord spake unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuses the waters of Shiloh that go softly, and rejoice in Rezin and Remaliah's son, now therefore the Lord, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria in all his glory, and he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks, and he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over, he shall reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land. O oh, Emmanuel, associate yourselves, O oh, you people, and you shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all you far countries. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. Literally, these individuals who are in a conspiracy against Isaiah, and a conspiracy even against King Ahaz, speak the word, they if they will, they forbid and they rebuke and they speak things into existence and it means absolutely nothing because God's against it. Christian, I want to pause here for just a moment and remark, if I may, on the importance of being involved with God's plan. The importance of being involved with God's plan. You know, this, this past election is a rough one, actually. Our, our country is very divided right now and it, and it hurts a lot actually to recognize. I think it's perhaps less divided uh, than the screamers would have you to think it is. Uh, I think that perhaps, you know, there are less Elizabeth Warren fans in the world than people would have you to think there is. You know what she did? She was uh, opposing Jeff Sessions and got shouted down in the, uh, in the Congress and so everybody else is now standing up for Elizabeth Warren and, and the fake news outlets are now uh, <laughs> are now uh, you know, touting that you know, they should have never stood against Elizabeth Warren because she's a new mouthpiece and uniting front for, for the uh, liberal opposition and so forth. And I don't think any of that's really true. I think everybody thinks Elizabeth Warren needs to shut up. 
but <laughs> the reality, I think, I really think that's the way that everybody I've heard anything on, even including liberals, uh, thinks about it. But you know, they'd have you to think that they're a big majority and that our country is very divided, and I think it is somewhat. Um, I'll be honest with you, this past election, we had an unbearable dilemma, and the, the unbearable thing was the oppression of the Clintons being on us again. I mean, the Clintons have oppressed America for too, too long, too many years. Nobody likes them. Their friends don't like them. They're just afraid of them. Everybody's afraid of them, except for Vladimir Putin, evidently. That's a joke. Uh, the thing is, is that, you know, it's a little bit of despair thinking, man, Hillary could be our president for four or even eight years. Nobody likes her, nobody wants her to, and she's, she's a horrid person. She just is. And I was relieved when she lost the election, weren't you? I think everybody, I think the Democrats were relieved that she lost. Now the Democrats wish she'd just go away. She says the future is female now. And they, they, I think they're thinking, well, the future isn't Clinton, as long as it's not a Clinton female. You know, go away, Hillary. And that's the way the world feels about it. It's rather oppressive. But then there's another side to it, and a side that thinks that somehow that Donald Trump is going to do God's will for the world. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I, personally, on a personal level, it seems as though, um, it seems as though he is attentive to righteousness or right to some degree. And I, I, don't, I don't mean to be controversial or talk politics this evening, but it just seems like Donald Trump wants to do right as president. And, uh, you know, you've got, to, you've got to speak up for that. Say, hey, you know, it seems like he's, thus far he's doing a pretty good job. It's too bad, though, that he hasn't talked more people into showing up for church on Wednesday night or Sunday morning. <laughs> Matter of fact, it's actually too bad that some Christians are so angry about uh, me not being a Trump supporter, they won't come back to church. Isn't it? You know? And um, it's too bad uh, that most believers actually think he's going to be the Savior. When he's not at all, actually. Uh, he cannot be. And the thing that I've said for years, and I realized some years ago, is that um, I'm an American all the way through, and I'm for this country. I'm, I'm for this country uh, succeeding. I, I have Christian friends who doesn't th don't think it's right for all people. They think all people should be equal, regardless of their political views, regardless of their work ethic and their effort and all those things. I think it's just fine to succeed. I think a successful person can help others. I'm all for American greatness, aren't you? Amen. Not against that. But um, God's not an American, and He never has been. And that's a real important truth, really important truth. Matter of fact, um, I have more in common with any Christian anywhere in the world than I have with Donald Trump. You understand what I'm saying? Why? Because we're on the same team, actually. And now Donald Trump, maybe, you know, he could have gotten saved for all I know. I don't know. Um, but um, he's not going to save the world. He's not the answer. And unfortunately, it seems as though many believers think, ha, ah, we won. God is now victorious. The battle's over. And the reality of it is, is that it isn't so at all. We need to preach the gospel like never before. We need to take advantage of freedom and the opportunities that are presented by it. And by the way, he's done a good job in proposing uh, amendments that give religious freedom and uh, dial back the ways that it's been taken away. Uh, so I'm all for that. But it won't do us any good if we don't preach the gospel more, if we don't hold to godly standards, and if we don't love the Lord with all of our heart, if we don't put our hope in Christ. See, most people think that because the NASDAQ reached an all-time high yesterday or because the Dow has reached peak levels in, in recent days, that somehow that our future or outlook is now bright. It may be for an investor, but my friend, I'll just tell you something. You can go to hell a rich man or a poor man, and you can go to heaven with a lot of eternal reward or nothing at all. And it really has nothing to do with any of the political benefits or even, dare I say, our religious freedom. We do not need religious freedom to have eternal rewards. 
I want religious freedom. I like religious freedom. I sleep better with religious freedom. But I don't need it. I never have. It's when we start thinking that that's where our hope is, is being free politically, we forget that, that, that actually God's plan is the important thing. Now notice with me, if you will, in verse 11, the Bible says, For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, notice this, say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Now here's the thing that they're frightened about. Reason and Pekah, these two kings, Remaliah's son and the king of Assyria, have united against Judah. And the people are really disturbed about it because of the conspiracy or the confederacy. In other words, it just seems too strong to overcome. But don't forget about remnant. Don't forget about remnant. And by the way, remnant uh, is representative of one-tenth. And so uh, perhaps he's more than just the tribe of Judah. There's a tenth of the people that are going to be left behind. In verse 13, here's what God says. First of all, he said, don't you be afraid of people. And Christian, God help us. God help us to be fearless in preaching the gospel and fearless in proclaiming the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes we think, oh, you know, it's just, yeah, maybe that's not the best place to preach the gospel. A little bit, you know, a little bit too strong. You know, I think maybe some of y'all ought to go down to Wilton Manors and stand on the streets and preach the gospel. Maybe it'd be good for us. You know, you think, oh, no, 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 that's, that's a wicked place. I think maybe, maybe uh, we ought to just get a map and just kind of map out some of the worst places in town preach the gospel in those places because God doesn't want us to say a confederacy. He doesn't want us to say, hey, that's a stronghold there. And I get so tired of hearing about strongholds. My friend, there's nothing strong about the one who's lost the battle to Jesus Christ. There is no stronghold. I wonder how people in those places are going to know where the gospel is preached and who is able to help them with the truth of the scripture if we don't take the gospel to the strongholds. You know, maybe we ought to go down to Federal Highway, you know, right across from the corner of Oakland Park Boulevard and US-1, where those, uh, those uh, filthy places are. And uh, maybe we ought to preach the gospel there, you know, in some strongholds. Maybe we ought to go down Wilton Manors and preach the gospel. Maybe we ought to go down on South Beach, some of these places, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, we think, oh, you know, Pastor, we don't want to stay out of there. That's a stronghold. Well, you know something? We're not to say a confederacy. It's the first thing. Second of all, Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself, and let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. First, we're not to fear man. Second, we're to fear God. You have a healthy fear of God, you'll have a uh, non-existent fear of man. When you and I find ourselves afraid of the wicked, or afraid to preach the gospel to the wicked, it's because we fear God too little and man too much. And that's exactly what, what Isaiah is in his message by God. Thirdly, in verse, we see some material to support this in verse 14. He shall be, if you sanctify him, for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the house of Israel, for a gen, the word gen, that's an interesting word, it, it means a trap, and for a snare, and a snare is like bait. It's a word that means like bait. So for a trap and for bait, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So you're afraid of Israel, who's larger, who's mightier, and who has an allegiance with Assyria. But friend, you have no reason to be afraid of them because you need to sanctify God and be afraid of Him. Don't be afraid of Israel and Syria. Be afraid of God. And then he goes on to say, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. What is the end of the wicked? Is it uncertain? Fright not thyself because of evildoers, neither about be thy envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down as grass and wither as the green herb. That's the end of the wicked. They're going to be cut down. They're going to wither. God's going to deal with the wicked. Why are you afraid of somebody God's going to deal with? Why are we afraid? Why are we fearful of wickedness? So we don't have our strength because of leadership 
In our nation, we have our strength because we fear God. We don't have our confidence because uh, we have constitutional rights to be confident and we have a court system that will support us in it. We have our confidence because we fear God and we're confident in His strength. So the third thing this evening, bind up the testimony, seal the law among thy disciples. So the first thing, don't be afraid of the wicked. Second thing, uh, be afraid of God. And the third thing, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my, thy disciples. What does that mean? What does it mean to bind up the testimony? What does it mean to bind something up? <clears throat> Think about ladders on I-95. Anybody, anybody seen a ladder on I-95 and thought too bad? For that ladder, or boy, I'm glad I wasn't there when that happened. But it seems like I-95 is a place for ladders to come off of trucks. And uh, boy, you know, if I'm going to take a ladder on I-95, I'm going to ratchet strap that thing down really good. Tie it up. Now tie it up. Secure that thing. Make sure it's not coming away. Bind up thy testimony. Now, Christian, I don't know if you can find a better place in the Scripture about memorizing the Scripture or getting God's Word in your heart. This is why we meditate on the Word of God. This is why we find out. Listen, if God has just said this to Judah, man, I'm telling you what, I say, Isaiah, come back with that. Uh, Zechariah, did you get that down? Uzziah, did you write that? Can I get a copy of that? I want to memorize that. Man, <laughs> it looks bad over there, and I need to, I need to fear God. See, and so get, get what God's Word has said. And then he says, basically, make disciples. Make disciples. Seal the law among my disciples. Find people that have faith in God, that believe God's Word, and teach it to them. Make disciples. Get people ready. You know, you ever wonder where Daniel got that fortitude that he had? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You ever wonder, like, where, where do those guys get their guts? Right here. They knew God's Word, and they were bound up. It was bound up in them and they were made disciples. So they had true prophets preaching the gospel, preaching the truth to them, preaching the word of God to them and it, it was accomplished. It was performed. And though they were not left behind for a remnant, they were responsible for Nehemiah going back and rebuilding Jerusalem. In verse 17, we see the final thing. I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob and I will look for him. So don't be afraid of Israel or Jacob. Wait, be, be afraid of the Lord and look for the Lord that has rejected those who have rejected Him. Do you think God's going to allow the wicked to triumph? Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. What are the children? Remnant and what? Remnant and yeah. Uh, this is well. Yeah. Predator. <laughs> Uh, swift to the prey. So remnant and predator are the sons. And he said, myself and my children were for a testimony of the Lord. You know what a wonderful family Isaiah must have had. Weird names. Probably weird kids. They probably love the Lord. Great they used to God. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening. I ask you to help us to love it, to live it, to retain it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.